completely different perspective than mine is, but we're kind of arriving at the same place, which I think is really the neat thing about how research in these areas are converging onto this kind of common representation of what's really going on. I will give you the caveat, though, that I do not have the cool movie at the end. So if you're holding your breath with that, I'm sorry. Okay, so there are a lot of different ways to look at this resident state fMRI data, right? And I've got, maybe there's too many ways. It's hard to make a choice sometimes when you're trying to decide on a study, right? You say, I wanna look at a difference between this control group and this patient drop population. How do you know which kind of method to use? Well, I'm not gonna tell you today. I am just gonna talk about one particular way we decided to look at this and try to explain why we're doing this. And really the underlying reason is that each of these ways that we look at the data, starting you know, with the seed-based functional connectivity that was kind of the first approach, all the way up to these new, more dynamic patterns, each of these has some underlying assumption that impacts how you interpret your results. So if you do a seed-based study, a lot of times you're thinking in terms of, okay, if I put my seed in the hippocampus, what is the hippocampus talking to? Right? There's this idea that there's some sort of direct communication going on. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not. You know, so if you look at the data in another way and you see the lag structure across the brain, maybe that's just part of a larger pattern of uh, neural activity. And so that influences how we interpret the results we get out of these studies, our underlying model. And so what my lab is trying to get to is an underlying model that we can validate against kind of fundamental mechanisms of neural activity to try to understand how we ought to interpret those differences with, for different studies, no matter which kind of method we use to look at them. So I've got, you know, what is the right way to look at resting state fMRI? And I don't want people to think that I'm saying that all these other ways are wrong. I think for us, the right way is something that lets us get to the most fundamental representation of the overall organization of activity in the brain, something that we can investigate with multimodal approaches, explore, and then interpret. And so, you know, I was trained as a physicist. For this, we're putting on our physicist hats and thinking of models the way a physicist would. So we want something that's simple. You want to capture the most information you can about your signal with the fewest components. We want something that's low level, meaning that we reflect properties of the signal and not secondary properties such as correlation or you know, things that express the relationship between areas. Um, I think I already mentioned explanatory. I worked that in earlier. We want something that tells us, you know, whatever mechanism we use to look at this data should give rise to the same properties that these other methods see. If you look and say um, with seed-based functional connectivity, you should see the same thing um, that we get in the empirical data. And because we're really interested in complex systems and dynamics, we also wanted something that considers the time structure of the data and not just the spatial structure. So moving beyond correlation to look at things, how things evolve over time in the brain system. And we, we had a clue already because ages ago, we started out interested in dynamics Sorry, I never talk hard enough. There we go. And we were just looking at activity in the brain, this was a anesthetized rats of the movie, and we saw these patterns, things that happened over and over again. And that was weird, right? You know, at the time we were thinking of functional connectivity as like two areas talking to each other, uh, related to cognition or something like that. And we're like, first of all, why are, are anesthetized rats being anything cognitive? And second, why is it happening over and over again? It's weird. It's like, you know, he's having the same thought every 20 seconds or something. So we developed a pattern finding algorithm to look at these overall patterns of activity throughout the brain. And so one of my students made this cool little cartoon to show how the algorithm works. So these are volumes of images over time. And we randomly select a chunk. For humans, that chunk is about 20 seconds long. And, you know, we can talk more about window length later. We take that chunk and we correlate it with all of the other possible chunks in the brain, all of those time segments. And so we've got correlation time course over here, 
And you can see there are peaks whenever we have time segments that look like that, it's the end of the segment that we randomly chose. We take those, we find those segments, we pull them out, and we average them together. That gives us a new template. Then we take that template and do the same thing again. We go through and we correlate it with everything, and eventually this converges, and our template doesn't change over time. And what we get out are the template itself, which is volume by time, so 20 seconds worth of activity, and this vector that tells us where that pattern is strongest in the scan. So we call these quasi-periodic patterns because, as you can kind of see in this, this fake correlation time course, they keep popping up in the background. It wasn't quite cyclical, but it was close. So let me show you what these look like. Come on, there we go. This is uh, the template created from the Human Connect Home Project data. And what you're going to be looking at is um, just activity over time in the template. Any activity that's depicted in warm colors is above the mean for that particular voxel. Anything in cool colors is below the mean. So here we go. So you see this nice division of the brain into these two anti-correlated systems, like the task positive network and the default mode network that we've heard about for ages. And what this captures that goes beyond that is a sort of propagation between the two, right? There's kind of an alternation of activity in the two areas and this stereotype switching between them that involves the motion of activity along the cortex. So I've got another slide here where we zoom in on the subcortical areas. And while the changes are smaller there, you can see that these areas are also involved in the same two networks. So this is really a whole brain phenomenon, which is really, really cool. And something that got us excited about this is when we went back to look at Daniel's gradients paper. So I've gotten this far in the talk that I've been mentioning gradients in the gradients workshop, right? But I said we we're coming back to the same place. And so this is, this is how we're kind of getting to that point. We looked at this primary gradient up here. Uh, now, there we go. And you can see that this looks very similar to this phase of the QPP. And actually, if I play that movie again, you see that the activity sweeps across the gradient from one end to the other, which it's really exciting to us, given all of the neurobiology that's related to these gradients. So we thought that that was really cool and maybe meant that we were on, you know, the path to something very interesting. So there are more than one functional connectivity gradient. We've talked mostly about the primary one, but you can also define secondary ones, et cetera. And uh, let's see, that was back here. So just let me put that up again for a second. So here, I think there are five. You can do the same thing with these QPPs. And the way we do that is we find the primary QPP, we remove it by regression, and then we run the analysis again. So we can get secondary, tertiary, et cetera. Uh, so here, these are six different QPPs, uh, starting with one up here at the top left and going to number six down here at the bottom right. You can see they get noisier as we regress more and more at the variance out of each iteration. And so I don't know how many it makes sense to really define, right? But these are just things that we put out for fun. And I can play the movies, you can see the templates. So again, these all have about that same length, about 20 seconds. And they all have some sort of alternation of positive and negative activity. And most of them have some sort of propagation. And if you line the secondary QPPs and tertiary up with the you know, non-primary functional connectivity gradients, you see that they match up, at least for the first three. We kind of quit looking at things after three because we lost confidence in how, how much of the signal variance we were explaining there. So this top row is, again, phases of the QPP, and this bottom row is the primary uh, functional connectivity gradient, secondary, tertiary. So they, they look pretty good. And in all of these, it looks like the activity kind of moves across the gradient. 
So we wanted to take a step back, given that, you know, this finding, and look at how the QPPs core, um, contribute to functional connectivity itself. So just simple correlation between different areas. So we, we get our trick again of regressing. We basically took our template. We can follow it with that time course that tells us how strong it is and regress it out of the signal. And when we do this, we can look at the changes in pairwise correlation across the whole brain. So this matrix was created from the glossy parcelation, so 360 by 360 parcels. And this top right corner shows um, the original correlation value. So you see a lot of anti-correlation here that's kind of between default mode network and task positive. And then within these boxes, you see kind of the inter-network correlation. Now, on the bottom side, this is what happens when we take out the primary QPP. And you see that we've lost in this bottom triangle now. We've lost most of that anti-correlation and also some of the correlation within networks. We can, of course, take out the secondary one and the third one. By the time we get re-removed, most of our functional connectivity is gone. So these large-scale patterns that involve the whole brain are really accounting for most of the pairwise functional connectivity or correlation that we see in our data. So these are driving that um, original finding of connectivity between areas. Now, not everything goes away. I think mean, it's really interesting. You see these diagonals. These are generally between left and right homologous areas, left and right motor cortex, left and right somatosensory areas. And connectivity there is still quite strong. It's intriguing. I don't know why, but I, I think that's very cool. Okay, so I, I want to go just a little bit into the new method that we're using now to look at these spatiotemporal patterns. We did the QPP algorithm for a long time, but I mentioned that you have to set a window link, right? And the patterns we get out are not necessarily orthogonal, so you know it makes it a little mathematically dubious sometimes when you're doing things like regression. So a really awesome uh, former postdoc in the lab, Hayward Bolt, set up a collaboration to look at these spatial temporal patterns in a new way. And he did a deeper dive into how they relate to all of these different um, versions of analysis we have, from functional connectivity gradients to C-based connectivity to graph theory. So I'm not going to show all, all of his work today, but I do want to show his new method because I think it's quite cool. And so to get rid of this requirement to set a window link, he looked into um, what people do for climate studies, how you can describe like worldwide climate oscillations. And people use a combination of standing waves and traveling waves. Let's see if this will play. This is always a question. Oh, good, good. Okay, so traveling waves move across areas. So like in the brain, for example, one area would lead another one in terms of the signal change. Whereas standing waves, you have activity that just goes up and down. And so if you think back to the QPP, we had patterns that were reminiscent of both of those, right? The propagation is like a traveling wave. And this alternation of activity in default mode and task positive main nodes, you know, that's more like a standing wave. So you can describe the, the activity in the brain as a combination of these two things. And so based on that, he adapted something called complex PCA, where you take your original signal, you do the Hilbert transform to make it complex, and then you run the PCA. So a very simple algorithm. But what that allows us to get is the amplitude of a wave and its phase. So you can pull out both the standing and the traveling components over time. And so what he's showing here is a simulated wave. That's our bright red activity at the top. It's using different time points going across. And that bright red activity is moving from top to bottom. So as the way that manifests then for the complex PCA is as this wave pattern of amplitude so here, the amplitude is strongest in the center, but then you also get a phase map that tells you where that amplitude is when. So it's the phase is earlier for the top of the image and later for the bottom. So we get the, the shape of the wave and how it moves across, in this case, the uh, field of view, but in our case, the brain. So the way that looks, um, I'm actually just going to skip through these because I have movies that I think will be better. These are the um, 
kind of the phase maps. We ended up taking three components because there's kind of an elbow in the amount of variance explained there. So we use that as a criterion for where to stop. So we've got three of these complex patterns and here is what they look like. This is the first one. Um, I don't know if you can read the numbers on the time, but these are also around 20 seconds long. So they ended up being very close to you know, the length of the QTP. And I'll go into these different patterns in just a second after they play. But they're like QPTs in that they are whole brain spatial temporal patterns. Okay, so you know, how do you interpret these? I think is the question. Um, the first one did not look exactly like QPTs, but it looks very similar to global signal. And we didn't do global signal regression on this data, so it's not surprising that that would be the primary component that we pull out first. So this is showing pattern one right now. Uh, that's the complex uh, component one. And coming up after that, this is global signal. And we've basically taken the peaks of the global signal and averaged the time points around it to get the, get the representation. And it looks very similar to that first principle component. So this is a way to pull out the spatial temporal dynamics of the global signal, which I think is cool. Um, maybe during the discussion, we can talk more about what that might be. So, so many topics. Um, the second one looks like our traditional QPT. And I should say here that we usually did QPT <coughs> analysis after global signal regression, which is so that's why we're not normally getting that global signal component. But here we think we're getting the same one. So here is the QPT that we normally get. And then here's our uh, second principal component. So lots of similarities. <coughs> and again, I'm not going to go into all of the comparisons he did, but what I'm showing here is that each of these columns is one of those three principal components. And all of these rows are different features, uh, coactivation patterns, seed-based correlation based on certain areas, uh, spatial ICA, he, he did a whole range of things. But almost all of them are strongly correlated with one of these primary components. So we think that this is a, a pretty good explanation of the underlying structure. So that's where we are. And I, I think this leaves us with some really interesting questions. Because now we've got these three whole brain patterns that account for most of the structure that we see, no matter what kind of analysis approach we take. Right? So all of it, it, it's interesting to think that all of your seed-based functional connectivity might come from like these three patterns. It, it, it's a much narrower space to search for explanations within. Um, the complex PCA is cool. It's not that much different from the quasi-periodic patterns, really. And so I think everything that we've done with those holds for CPCA, too. But I, I think this makes us think about how we interpret resting state fMRI. It's really these systems-level changes in activity. We, we need to put our findings in that context. And I think this also gives us scope for new theories about how the brain is organized. So that, you know, that's kind of the pluses. That's what we found. <laughs> What don't we know? Well, even though these three patterns account for, it's about two thirds of the functional connectivity, they only account for about a third of the variance. And so that's 70% of the variance in the rest of the state fMRI that we still don't understand. You know, so what happens if we take these components out? Maybe then we get closer to this idea of area to area communication, right? Or individual events, spontaneous changes in cognition. Um, maybe that'll work. I don't know. I, I'm still trying to investigate that. I hope other people will help us. And then, of course, there's noise. We know there's a lot of noise in the rest of the state of MRI. How much of that other variability is noise and how much of it is interesting, I think is still an open question. So I just want to acknowledge the three people whose work was really key for this. Wakas Najib started the original QPP algorithm. Banaji Steffi refined it and applied it to the Human Connection Project data. And then Taylor Gold has come up with the complex PCA approach. So thank you all for listening, and I hope we can have some good discussions about this.
And is there any quick question for Sheila? Oh, uh, sorry, Manesh was super fast. <laughs> well, my question, uh, you know, you said how your motivation was uh, found it as the pesticides rats. I'm wondering, have you done it in in uh, pesticides humans and what's the farmers pattern? And if so, uh, how do you interpret it? It must not relate to ongoing cognition then. Um, so what, 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 what might be being captured by these patterns of this cycle? So, so we still don't know. Um, we have not done anesthetized humans, but we've looked at anesthetized and awake macaques. And so we see the patterns in both. Their, um, their shape changes a little bit. The timing and the strength change a little bit, but the overall pattern is still there. Our guess is that maybe this is neuromodulatory, possibly linked to arousal. So we see some changes. Um, we see some changes that we <laughs> could be driven by fluctuations in the arousal state in the resting, you know, during the resting state scan. Now, of course, our anesthetized animals shouldn't really be undergoing those. So we're still trying to understand where that comes from. Um, but as support for that, if you give rats this neurotoxin that kills off the locus aurelius uh, nuclei, the patterns go away. So, you know, these neuromodulatory systems are all, all interconnected. I don't want to say it's one or the other. But I think we've managed to break the system and that messed up this organization. So a piece of evidence. Thank you so much, Shella. Great talking to Okay, next we have Takuya Ito talking about multitask representations in human cortex transform along a centered mode. Yeah, just use this. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Taku. I'm a postdoc at Yale University working with John Murray. And so I want you to imagine the task of crossing a busy street uh, with a lot of distracting sensory stimuli like the Shibuya crossing in Tokyo. Now, to do this task, we have to filter out a lot of irrelevant information um, to hone in on the single piece of information that's useful for this task. So in this case, it'd be a track play. Now, in general, it's thought that these processes of extracting out sensory information uh, is done through hierarchical processing. And so this is a well-known diagram by Feldman and Essen in 1991, in which they map out the structural time and safety hierarchy of the primate visual system. Uh, and then there's more recent work by Nanny Evans and Ginger Carlo and others, which have shown that different levels of this hierarchy extract down different levels of sensory representations. And so you might have visual input projected onto the retina, and then at higher order areas, like uh, before NIT, you might see audio representations, and then uh, in higher order cortex, you might have higher order representations that might mix with context. Right, and so in general, what we can say about this is that uh, the algorithms of hierarchical sensory processing are fairly well documented in monkeys, humans, and also in artificial neural networks. Um, and so what we wanted to hone in on here was to understand the information processing hierarchies for multitask settings in humans and also just extend that prior work beyond just sensory cortex. All right, so we set ourselves three main goals. Uh, the first is just to characterize the organization of multitask representations across the cortex. Uh, the second is to ask whether or not it's related to intrinsic hierarchical organization, so relevant to Gradients workshop. And then lastly, just to ask how are the representations actually transformed across different cortical areas and cortical hierarchies? All right, so the way we studied multitask representations was to use RSA or representational similarity analysis. This was pioneered by Nico Previous Sports and colleagues back in 2008. Um, and so our general model modeling strategy was to apply uh, some cortical atlas or parcellation. So in this case, we use the Glasser atlas which has 360 different cortical parcels. And within each parcel, you might have anywhere from 50 to a couple hundred vertices or voxels. And so the idea was to, uh, within each parcel, extract out the voxel activation pattern or the vertex activation pattern across many different tasks. So if you have n different tasks, you can extract out n different voxel activation patterns for that parcel. And then if you can compute the similarity uh, across all these different task conditions to compute a n by n, matrix or a task by task matrix. So this is a parcel level representational similarity matrix or parcel level parts. And so this is gonna be the main data object that we use for our analysis. 
So the data set we use is a pub publicly available resource. Uh, it was published by my book King and colleagues from New Orleans Dietrichson's group at Western University of Canada. And so the general motivation for this data set was to sample as many different tasks and cognitive batteries as possible. So it's multi-domain task battery. It has 26 different tasks and up to 45 different task conditions. And just to illustrate the richness of this data set, here are 12 example portable activation maps. And so I encourage anybody who's interested in multitask analyses to, to look into this data set. All right, so we take kind of four key approaches to study multitask representations. Uh, the first is again, RSA at the parcel level or the regional level. And then the second is to characterize the entire cortical topography of, of representational alignment. So in this case, representational alignment just refers to the alignment or the similarity of parcel-wise RSMs between pairs of parcels. And so this way you can construct a, a whole cortex matrix, a whole, whole brain uh, representational alignment matrix. And so once we have those established, we can ask more detailed questions. So in this case, we can ask how the geometry or the dimensionality of, of the RSMs or the representations actually change across cortical hierarchies. So say, for example, uh, from sensory to, to association to motor areas, we can ask how the dimensionality changes. And you can say, or hypothesize whether or not the dimensionality expands then compresses, that there might be no change in the dimensionality or it actually compresses and expands. And then finally, we'll ask, uh, or try to understand the conditions by which we can produce brain-like representations in uh, computational models. And in this case, those computational models will be simple, deep linear neural networks or standard deep neural networks. All right, so let's just start with the first two. Um, so here are just three example RSMs for a visual, motor, and prefrontal region. So kind of the main thing to take away from here is that the RSMs are quite different qualitatively and quantitatively, so we can help to kind of get useful information out of, out of this. Also, just to clarify, these RSMs are cross-validated cross runs, and so uh, that's why you might not see a strong tag necessarily. Uh, so you can then estimate the representational alignment between pairs of regions, right? Again, this measure is just a, a measure of the representation or how representations are shared between brain regions. And so this is the whole brain RA matrix, and you can kind of baseline or compare that to the standard resting state FC matrix. And the correlation between these two is about R of 0.37. So this is actually slightly lower than what I would have expected a priori, but on the upshot, what that means is that there could be additional information in this RA matrix that is, uh, or that you can clean, or additional information that you can't clean from the traditional RSFC matrix. It's also kind of important to keep in mind that. Uh, these matrices are actually generated from fundamentally different data sources. Right? The RA is from the similarity of task or multitask RSMs, while uh, the rest of the state of C is just the similarity of co-punctuation starting task free. All right. Um, right. So the simplest thing we can do to characterize the topography of these representations or these matrices is just to run a PCA or a gradient analysis. Right, so if you extract the first PC of the resting state FC matrix, you get the canonical uh, unimodal transport gradient by Dan Markley's back in 2016, right, where you have sensory motor areas on one end of the axis and association areas on other ends of the axis. Uh, and then you can do the same thing for your RA matrix, but you kind of get a different principal gradient. Right? So in this case, you end up getting uh, visual and motor regions on opposite ends of this axis, and so you can kind of group like kind of large swaths of cortex together into sensory association motor areas, and you see that the loadings map onto these systems in a monotonic way from sensory and motor areas. And so what we realize is that this looks more similar to the second component of resting state FC, uh, which maps kind of a visual to motor gradient. And so we just computed the similarity of these two brain maps, and the correlation was, was fairly strong, R1.9. All right, so now. Oh, just kind of the main takeaways from that. Um, there are more kind of characterizations that we have in the preprint that I'll link to at the end, but the main takeaway for this is really just um, that the principal axis of multitask representational variation is primarily along the sensory motor hierarchy. And so this kind of intuitively makes sense because right, sensory and motor cortices are amongst the most functionally specialized 
brain regions are in cortex. And so it makes sense in a multitask battery that you have very functionally distinct representations in, in those two areas. So functionally kind of different and, and distal. All right. Um, all right, so how do we measure the dimensionality of this RSM, all right? So we took multiple approaches, but the one I'll just describe now is to estimate the participation ratio of this matrix. And very briefly, the participation ratio is estimated by computing uh, or doing eigen decomposition on this matrix, getting the eigen spectrum and asking how flat that eigen spectrum is. So the flatter the eigen spectrum, the higher the dimensionality. So another way to think about it for those of you who like PCA is, uh, if you want to explain X amount of variance, the more PCs that are required to explain that amount of variance, the higher the dimensionality of that matrix will be. And here just have three, or sorry, two schematics, uh, examples of high dimensional, low dimensional RSM, but there can be other configurations as well. Um, so overall, this is the map of the representation dimensionality uh, across uh, every parcel. And so we found it was highly correlated with the resting state gradient one or the unimodal transmodal gradient. And so what that means in practice is that unimodal regions are higher dimensional and transmodal regions are lower dimensional. And so if you were to plot um, the dimensionality across the greatest axis variation of, of multitask representations, uh, you'd find the dimensionality along the RSFT group gradient two. So here you have uh, visual regions and over here you have motor regions you find that the best fit polynomial is a, a convex quadratic. So what that means is that the dimensionality compresses then expands along the sensory motor hierarchy. Um, and so you can kind of group together these regions into large systems and find them you know, from sensory to association, you have compression of that dimensionality, <laughs> and then from association to motor, you have expansion. Right, so the context of these three competing hypotheses, you, our data is most consistent with this. Right. Just the last part. All right. So when you look at the literature in machine learning to care, try to understand the representations and the dimensionality of hidden layers as a function of your input and output, uh, what you tend to find uh, is that so here you have dimensionality on the y-axis and the relative depth for the hidden layer depth on, on the x-axis, and these are all you know, state of the art deep neural networks trained to perform image recognition on ImageNet. What you find is that the dimensionality typically actually expands that compresses. And so this is uh, kind of in direct contrast with our empirical data. And so what we wanted to try to do was see if we could produce compression and expansion in, in, in Um And so our modeling approach was to directly model the data in that we picked two regions on the opposite ends of uh, the sensory to motor hierarchy. So you pick one motor region and one visual region and extract out the voxel activation patterns for each of those regions. And then in effect, just train a, a deep linear neural network to predict the motor activation patterns using the visual voxel wise activation patterns as input. And kind of without getting into too many details, you can push ANNs into different learning regimes by just speaking hyperparameters at initialization. And so if you just take off the shelf parameters from any package like PyTorch or TensorFlow, uh, we'll call this the so-called lazy regime or lazy training machine, you kind of get this expansion uh, and compression of, of dimensionality representation. So this is dimensionality on the y-axis, as in plot here, and then uh, layer depth on the x-axis. And right, so if you tweak these hyperparameters, so in this case, you're just tweaking the weight initialization scale um, before you actually train, you can enter the kind of so-called feature-rich training regime. And so in the feature-rich training regime, you end up getting kind of this compression and expansion of representations that matches our empirical data. And so the main things I just want to say about this are just that rich training produces compression and expansion of task representations across the feed forward hierarchy, and that there are previous studies in neuroscience that have actually looked at these rich representations and then found that they are more generalizable and also more robust. Noise. I will say that this rich training regime is significantly more computationally expensive. So it takes a much longer time to train, which is probably why it's not off the shelf default uh, parameter choice. 
Uh, and just, I think I'm running out of time, so I just put one slide just to show that the rich representations are more similar to the, if you were to compare the representations in the and then and compare with those in the empirical data, you find that overall across the entire cortex, the representations in the rich feature neural network are more similar to uh, are more similar than the lazy, lazily trained neural network. All right, just to summarize, the, the topography of multitask representations is principally organized along a sensory motor hierarchy, right? and so these representations across this hierarchy are compressed and expanded. And this is in direct contrast to typical findings in the machine learning literature. And so what might the benefits of compressed representations, especially in association areas be? Right? And so our thinking or our ongoing hypothesis about this is that if you have shared components across many tasks, so it's kind of shared latent spaces, this should lead to better generalization uh, to novel tasks. Uh, so this is kind of ongoing work that we have to we're working on that you, you can have just any kind of multitask data set for this. You need some tasks, some compositional tasks that have shared structure across different tasks and different uh, task conditions. Uh, and then so in models, uh, compression and expansion is produced specifically under you know, so-called rich training regime, which ends up producing more brain-like representations and produces, I realize I, I didn't show any slides on this, but uh, hopefully you can believe me. Uh, but it just produces hierarchically organized representations as ANS. Um, yeah, that's, that's it. So that's your attention. And this is the preprint. Does anyone have a quick question for Daphne? Okay. I would have a clip on that actually. You, you mentioned a lot that there's an expansion in motor areas. How much do you think that's also related to sensor, like some other sensory cortex being that? Right, so do you yeah. think this makes sense to like sensory? Right, I guess in general, we don't. It's a good question. But um, in most of the tasks, you have kind of you know, sensory input and then you have some motor output. So we're really kind of grouping them together and I do think some sensory cortex properties that are suited for. Uh, group together with the cortex, but uh, in practice, the motor signals and some as sensory signals probably are aligned yeah. in, in this multitasking battery. Yeah, and it explains why you get the more like, like the prototypical second grading. It's like yeah. visual to sit mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's great. Thank you so Thanks. much. Uh, well, you can stay up here if you like, actually. And can I call the other two speakers up as well? Shall I say a close Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to have a close up. Also, some water. <laughs> okay, so yeah, take care of the speakers. Um, put on some mics through that. <laughs> Thanks. And now we can just open it up. Um, so we've seen some really fantastic talks of very different techniques as well, from very local techniques and more global dynamics, and even working towards deep learning approach as well. Yeah, Boris, do you want to come down and uh, and Boris is going to lead us in a little bit of a discussion panel now, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'll check if there's any questions in here. I think we're good. Um, yeah, any other any questions? Like, feel free to start, and we'll. Um, so if there are, I can maybe also get started with like a question uh, it's for the last talk, where you mentioned that there's like a compression uh, followed by an expansion um, architecture. Is that, could you think of this more generally as being related to an autoencoder architecture of the, of the brain that kind of mimics similar properties? Yeah, for sure. But I guess in the autoencoder, the decoder is also still decoding the input features, but in the case of a, a decoding from association to motor, you're probably actually transforming uh, the actual information you have in the, in the latent space is a more actionable representation. That's my intuition about it. Yeah. Do you think that the that you have a stronger dissociation with sensory to motor um, networks in a way that it's that it's different from resting state where you have like it's more sensory unimodal to transmodal architecture that this relates to how tasks are generally 
um, setups that we always have visual input and then a motor response. Well, yeah, so that's not always the case that you have this, but I guess oftentimes in, in fMRI experiments, you typically have you know, sensory cues and then sensory stimuli, and then you merge those two to produce you know, a blood press. And so I think that's what we're seeing typically, but in resting state FC, I think you get the unimodal transmission hierarchy, but I think that might be driven a lot due to the structure of the fluctuation. Maybe Michelle can talk, speak some more about this, but I think right there, the time scale of unimodal regions and transmodal regions are actually much more similar. And so I think that might naturally cluster its fluctuations together. But it's also spontaneous activity, right? So there's no task driven or simple uh, strip. And movie, movie paradigms, do they sit somewhere in the middle? Well, I don't know. <laughs> 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 Um, uh, comment on that um, in terms of the time scales. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's really interesting because there's definitely kind of this, this common pathway for our global patterns to propagate. You know, it seems like the sensory areas typically lead and go to the, towards the transmodal areas, but we sometimes see it go the other way. Like it's more the reverse half of the cycle that's stronger. And we've been starting to look at this in task. At, we actually have a paper out on it with HCP and the working memory task. But in the HCP data, the working memory task, you know, is done in blocks of like 15 seconds, which is kind of hard to disentangle from the global patterns. So we're doing it again in continuous performance tasks, and we're seeing differences, but I don't have the final answer yet. Yeah, you open questions in the crowd. I have a question probably was related to Chala's presentation. You mentioned you looked at these um, fluctuations or cyclic patterns in first in the rat, in the rodent, and later in the human, and also in macaques. And you said the timings were a little bit different. But um, so can you elaborate a little bit on the, the differences in shared aspects that we saw? Sure, sure. So in all of the species, we see kind of this unimodal to transmodal propagation. The length of the time that it takes to go from one area to another is different for the cycle. The length of the cycle is different across species. It's shorter in rats and mice and longer in humans. Uh, the monkeys are closer to humans than the rodents. Um, it's also impacted by anesthesia. I think that's really interesting. Because so in rats, if we use dexmedetomidine, and the cycles are about six seconds, if we use isoborine, it's more like 12 or 13. Those have different effects, not just on the neural activity, but also on the vasculature. And something I didn't talk about today is that we've seen that these patterns are linked to intraslow electrical activity, which has also been linked to changes in the vasculature. So I, I think there's some ambiguity still about whether these are arising directly from neural activity or some sort of the vascular propagation after the neural activity. And we're still trying to you know, figure that out. Now, in support of a neural basis, optical imaging studies have seen similar propagation at very low frequency. So there is something there. I think they're just all tangled up again. Just quickly to follow up, do you think it could be the size of the brain? That plays a role, or I think that's part of it, but also it's the typical hemodynamic delay, right? So in rodents, if you just do a stimulus uh, test, um, the delay is like one to two seconds in awake rats, two to three in anesthetized, four to five seconds in isoforing anesthetized rats. So the, the prolongation of the cycle that we see is similar to the change in the hemodynamic delay across species. Did you have something to add to that? No, no I, I was actually going to, I wanted to ask, if you answered the question, uh, whether, how, how, how different are they, uh, um, the, the time actually. Well, some of those are from optical studies. You know, it's hard to get really good data for fMRI and make that sense. Shella, I also have a question for your work. Um, you mentioned that the brain, that these three patterns, they you know, compactly describe fluctuations. Um, can you 
or have you already explored a little bit into individual variations with respect to that? that like in some folks, it may be more uh, what types of patterns that you need to explain the variations, or you think this is very robustly seen across all the individuals that you've studied so far? You know, that, that's a great question. We have not looked at the complex PCA approach at the individual level yet. We've done that on the group level. We've done the QPP approach at the individual level, and it's incredibly robust. I mean, you, you can get a nice template from a single run and a single animal or a single person. So that said, there are differences in the timing. And part of the reason we're motivated to try the complex PCA is it seems like some people have slightly faster cycles, 18 seconds. And some people have slightly slower cycles, 22 seconds. And I don't know what the behavioral or cognitive implications of that is, but I, I think now that we've got a little bit more mathematically principled way to explore this, we can start to look at those kind of relationships. Do you think it's related to arousal at all? Or? Yeah, I, I think a lot of it's related to arousal. And I don't know if it's the, the length of the pattern is related to the arousal or if it's the relative contribution of the pattern. So it's more of a state effect or is like a individual effects? Like is it, is the rate of the QPP consistent across runs for an individual versus is it equally variable? I, I think it's more variable across individuals than across a run right. in terms of the timing. And the amplitude varies a lot across runs. And this is again, you know, back to arousal. Like you see very different levels of QPPs in the first run of an hour session than you do in the last run. I have a question on the template. So, if I understand correctly, you, you get those small chunks and you correlate the process. Yeah. Uh, do you do you then um, sort of do that whole process again with a different chunk, or how, how do you how do you decide where you took sample? And go, go? Yeah. So we started by taking one of those chunks where we actually saw the pattern, but, yeah. and then we realized one time we screwed up and we set to something else, okay. and it converts to the same pattern just because it's so strong that it kind of comes. Through even oh. if you set a different random chunk. So you say pick the sort of lower, sort of the, the trunk instead of the peak. Yeah. You, 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 you can get a different phase of the pattern. Okay. So that you start with the default mode active instead of the task positive network. But the pattern. But the, the, pattern, the cycle, the cyclical pattern is the same. Okay. Now that said, in practice, what we normally do is either take a bunch of random seeds and cluster to make sure we get a good robust result or if you're not started doing uh, speed from every single time point, okay. and then clustering and taking the strongest template. So but there's different ways to get around that issue. I would have really expected different pattern for some reason. I know, it's weird. I mean, you, you can get some differences, but it's more remarkable that you get the same yeah. thing so much. Are there some more general recommendations for image acquisition that you would have in order to have good sensitivity to identify these patterns, like very long scans, uh, five minute scans, uh, image acquisition speed? Well, you know, um, from the desired perspective, yeah, I, I think we should sample a 100 millisecond TR. I think we should take data for an hour at a time. You know, now how much of that is actually practical is depending on your patient population, for one thing. But yeah, more data makes it better. Uh, one here and then we're going to um, So I guess I have a question to push it up, although we for the overall file. Um, so you started off with your talk and you were talking about this aim of trying to characterize a method that allows you to understand something mechanistic about the brain, something that is principled. And you took us through this amazing, I'd say, comparison between the different modalities, um, sort of different approaches. What I was wondering, though, is is at the right, the right source of data to answer these type of questions? Like, why not? Like, if we are interested in these fast oscillating dynamics, why not looking at NEG data given that we have? Full brain coverage, or even like calcium imaging at the mesoscale. Yes, I mean, I, I think we can all agree that fMRI is strongest, right? I think um, we find that the spatial and temporal resolution of fMRI for whole brain 
characterization of activity really can't be met by any other modality. MG, like you said, I mean, it, it's great, you get the fast bits, but you, you have much more limited localization. And especially if you're trying to characterize the intrinsic activity, you know, it, it's hard to figure out exactly where some of that is coming from. So we lose the spatial information. Um, however, especially in regards to your note about hacking imaging, we're currently trying to set up simultaneous fMRI and optical wide field imaging. That'll give us the optical image across the whole cortex that we can compare to what we see with the gold throughout the whole brain and kind of put the two in context because you know it's only cortical with the optical imaging, but we can look directly at neural activity and at some types of neural activity even, and then see how that lines up with what this kind of full brain state you measure with that MRI. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, thank you for bringing up the, uh, the photo imaging. Um, which study of operations do you think are driving this different? Uh, what do you think that plays a role? Okay. I, I think that plays a role. I'm really curious. I'm sure neurons are involved just because we've seen, you know, things between neural activity and fMRI for forever. I'm curious about astrocytes. Especially with the links to the hemodynamics and the changes in the blood vessels that give rise to some of these have to slow out oscillations. I really wonder what they're doing at a widespread spatial level, and I can't find that anyone's looked at that. We're trying to get it set up, but I don't know anything about the genetic manipulations in mice, so that's mm -hmm. been the sticking point there. Thank you. I think maybe a follow-up question to this could also be, um, have you looked at this at 7 Tesla, for example, to look at specific layer um, Supergranular versus intragranular layers, for example? No, but Emory had a seven Tesla two weeks ago for humans. And as soon as we can put somebody in, mm -hmm. I'm on that. We, we want to do the same thing. We're giving an 11 7 for animals. And so we want to push to the laminar where it's there too and do this sort of cross species examination of dynamics. Can I just pick up on that question quickly and then I'm coming to you so I'm sorry. Um, to, to the other two as well, for Claude and Taku, like have you also looked at for uh, Claude, like the whether boundaries are stricter at certain lamina? And also then for Taku, whether you see this representational differences varies at a, as a function of lamina differentiation or at different layers as well. So okay, Claude. So no, at the moment we're sticking to sort of the uh, sort of mid thickness just because of the resolution of the standards that we have. I mean, we'd love to do it, um, uh, but but at the moment I, I don't have access to any of those standards that uh, can can do anything that's better. Have you ever spotted it in like the historical literature mm -hmm. at all? People talk about and um, and. No, no, no. Uh, no, I guess I'm limited by <laughs> the publicly available data resources. Um, but I do know that um, I think Emily Finn had a paper with Peter Manatee a couple years ago on working memory mode and DLPFC, but that's as far as I know, it's one of the few studies that have looked at lab room differences during tests. I think it's on everyone's wish list. Uh, so yeah, I have a more quick question too. Stella and Kathleen, um, thanks for your great talk. Uh, it's probably the question that you had more times from other folks, but uh, regarding the underlying source of this QPP for this low performance fluctuation, I know your paper uh, cropped uh, the effect of uh, reticular formation. So it's actually part of the Kathleen's uh, uh, point uh, about the router. What is if you have any call on general call on the underlying source, and then what, what is the meaning of this? For instance, your QPP one, we are confused, but uh, between external and internal um, state changes, uh, have you ever had any like thought that what, what is the functional mechanism? What what actually human being uh, is doing in this, uh, during this uh, change of state? Okay, well, I'll take a shot at it now. Um, so I'm coming at this very much from kind of a systems physics perspective and not from a cognitive or psychological perspective. So I hope some of you all can help me out. Uh, in terms of mechanism, we came up 
by talking to people, we came up with two things that we thought could drive the, the sort of widespread spatial coordination. And one is these deep neuromodulatory nuclei. So that would be involved in arousal, things like the LC. You know, I've said that if we mess that up, things go away. This is also consistent with um, some findings. Like if you look at the QPP, the brainstem and the thalamus lead the changes on the cortex. So there's a timing difference there that supports that sort of origin. The other thing we came up with is maybe that some of this is driven by this um, network structure of the brain. You know, maybe it's kind of a network resonance. And so we looked at that using some brain network models. And what we found is that if we took these state-of-the-art brain network models and let them run and then put the output through the QPT algorithm, we could get the two-state solution to pop out. So, you know, task positive and DMN. And that was fairly robust, the parameterizations, the timing change and things like that, um, which is interesting based on our talk about how long the cycles are, is a timing change depending on the coupling and the, the structural like coupling between nodes. Between nodes. Yes. So maybe that's what drives individual differences. I don't know. But anyway, we get the two state solution, but we don't get the propagation. And we don't get the complexity that we see in the real data. So maybe that's a piece of it too. You know, maybe it's partly input and partly resonance. Yeah, you can continue. Uh, I had a question to and for uh, I was uh, fascinated by the it's dimension of the difference between uh, low level centering and also treatment context. Um, so that your finding is uh, those low level primary centering have rather higher minimality and associations the other way around. Um, in a sense, it sounds a bit paradoxical to me that um, thinking about the role of income model, for instance, I'm coming back to income model, but uh, if you think about the uh, representation space of this income model, I usually think that DMN should have much higher um, uh, uh, rich representations uh, to model the, the external work. And then, uh, and then uh, rather the, the century or whatever it shows more stroke time, uh, in a sense, uh, low memory and other patterns, but you should get away with it. Have you ever um, I guess there's multiple ways I can think. So I would say in general, there have been a number of studies, especially those in you know, the prefrontal cortex, which have already reported overall low decodability in prefrontal areas. And I guess for a long time, I guess, people still are trying to figure out exactly why that is. And I think it may have to do with the fact that, you know, you have shared components across many different tasks that help to, you know, rapid general, generalization across, uh, or to a novel task. Um, but I think my general intuition about the reason why you have higher dimensionality in sensory and motor areas is really due to receptive field size. Um, and so, you know, visual, especially as you go from V1 to IT in the eventual visual system, your receptive field size kind of increases as a function of hierarchy depth. And so probably at the level of DMN, you have many mixed signals and mixed receptive fields that, that overall leads to a, a shared structure that is overall lower dimensional. So that's just one way to think about it. Unfortunately, we, we do have to wrap up now so we can still squeeze in a coffee break, but uh, feel free to come up and talk and I'll be for sessions later today and small questions. So let's see. So once again, thank you so much.